This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Nicholson, who all of us know. Um, he's an associate professor of uh, medicine and cardiology and director of interventional cardiology here at Emory, and also serves as a program director for uh, advanced uh, complex high-risk PCI, the CHIP program. And uh, today he has with us uh, a group of amazing fellows or and former fellows who are now current attendings. I see Nick and Fatik's uh, names on this list. Um, and we're going to be presenting five cases and I'm gonna turn it over to Bill to introduce everyone and take over. Great, Thank, thanks so much, Pooja. Thanks for having us. So this is a just a, a fun opportunity we have every year to kind of uh, give an, a little bit of an example of some of the complex cases that we're doing uh, here. We've really become uh, extremely well-recognized uh, high complexity program uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, the cases we have are, are kind of representative. They're actually not all that uh, unusual. It's what, just a normal Tuesday a lot of times for us, but the cases are pretty remarkable uh, when you look at the complexity that's being done. And we'll show some data that goes to support uh, what we're doing with these complex cases and a little bit of our own internal uh, data on how we uh, measure up across uh, the country. But we're gonna have each of our fellows present. Uh, we've got just an absolutely uh, outstanding group of, of uh, interventional fellows. And then we have our CHIP fellow too. So Nick Shekalazzi is our CHIP fellow this year as complex high-risk intervention. So he stays on for an extra year to do that after he already did interventional and Nick actually already did structural too. So Nick's you know, the most overtrained person in the United States. Um, and then Miriam Swan, uh, just outstanding. She's going to be uh, one of our complex uh, interventional fellows next year. For us, he's already done uh, critical care and heart failure and is just outstanding, too. We've got Chris Bruce. Chris comes with an extensive experience of electric surgery. A lot of the transcable stuff that was invented at the NIH, Chris has been a big part of that and is doing his interventional year uh, with us. And then Maddie Parker came to us from Canada. She's uh, absolutely outstanding as well. She's going to stay on along with Miriam. So we'll have two uh, chip fellows next year. But We've got a lot of cases to go through, so I'm not going to spend too much more time uh, kind of leading up to it. I'll let each of the fellows sort of present the cases and any questions that you have, I uh, feel free to interrupt or we can talk about it at the end. So I think we're going to start out with Frost. If that's okay. Hey, everybody. This is Frost. Um, I'll be presenting the first case of chronic uh, vein graft failure. So we have a 60-year-old male with history of CD, had a uh, bypass surgery in 2010 with three vein grafts, one to the LAD, Diag, and CERC, um, and the CERC graft was occluded. Also had newly diagnosed ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EFF 30 to 35%, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Um, he presented to EUH with a high-risk NSTEMI with a peak troponin of uh, around 5,000. And you can see his EKG, um, he had some ST elevations in uh, V1 that didn't meet uh, STEMI criteria, but he had some biphasic uh, T wave changes that were concerning to us for a prox um, LAD lesion. And you can see the drop in his EF, I think his baseline was around 40%, it dropped to around 30% during this admission. So we took him to the cath lab and uh, we quickly um, realized that uh, we couldn't engage the left main and we were concerned for a CTO of uh, the left main at the ostium. And when we engage the vein graft to the LAD, um, you can see that there is a prior stent um, with a, a critical instant restenosis that was a culprit for this presentation. And it looks like he also confirmed that he had a CTO of his left main. So we performed a rescue PCI of the vein graft uh, to minimize ischemia and salvage um, his myocardial function. And uh, we had a good result with that. Um, he also had a lesion in his RCA. So we staged it uh, two days later during the same admission. Um, and the patient was discharged home on GDMT for his uh, uh, reduced EF. And so um, we, we're facing a situation over here where his vein graft um, had failed twice. He already had a stent before um, in that vein graft and he had instant restenosis. Um, and that vein graft is going to the LD supplying a large uh, portion of his myocardium. Um, you know, looking at the guidelines, um, there is not a lot of data, but from the data that we have, the 2018 European guidelines recommended performing PCI on the native vessel as preferred over the bypass with a grade uh, or class 2A recommendation uh, for that. And also looking at uh, some of the data, um, there is um, there, there was a study that looked at 1,600 patients, including multiple high-risk operators in the country, including Dr. Jabber from our institution between 2012 and 2019 that showed that um, performing PCI on the native vessel, even if it's a CTO, 
has better outcomes than um, uh, doing PCI on the vein graft. And, you know, there was a case series that looked at similar patients to ours where they came in with a high risk and STEMI from a vein graft culprit, performed PCI on that vein graft to use it as a conduit for a stage intervention on the native vessel in the future with uh, favorable outcomes. So because of all of that, um, we decided to perform a, a CTO PCI on the patient's native left main. Um, and this is the first picture that we have from that um, procedure. Um, so you can see over here, um, it's a busy slide, but we can go over it together. So we have a guide uh, catheter over here that's engaged into the vein graft. And we have another guide catheter that is um, uh, facing the left main and, and telling us where it is or the ballpark um, of the left main. And then we um, wired the vein graft with a specialty wire into the LED, went retrograde and penetrated the distal cap of the lesion into the proximal cap and went into um, the aorta. And so I have a little bit of an amateur drawing over here to try to just go over that. Um, and you can see again, the aortic arch sending aorta, vein graft going into the um, LAD. And then we went with our wire into the soft part of the, the distal cap of the lesion, penetrated the proximal cap into the aorta. And so now you can see that we have our wire that's in the ascending aorta, um, and we advance it uh, in, um, in the ascending aorta. And then we took that wire into the aortic, uh, to the uh, subclavian artery. And our, 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 our purpose of that is to try to engage the left main. And so you can see um, in the next slide where we took back the guide that we wanted to engage the left main with, and we had a snare in it and we snared that wire into um, that guide catheter. And so, and so when we do that, we create a situation where we, have, we can rail that guide or use a tra uh, or uh, guide it into the uh, left main and um, um, over that wire. And we can see that happening over here in this video. And so once we did that, now we um, in, have engaged the left main and we have a wire going down the LED. So we converted our retrograde case into an anti-grade case and we can proceed with a left main PCI as we usually do. And so over here, um, we just proceeded and we centered the left main. Um, and as you can imagine, when we sent the, you know, the lesion is, includes the ostium. So inevitably, the stent has to protrude into the um, um, uh, aorta, um, which, you know, if you, uh, most of you guys have performed um, diagnostic caths and you know that it's very hard to uh, engage a left main or an RCA that has a stent protruding into the aorta. But recently, we've been using a specialty balloon that came up a couple of years ago called a osseal flash. And you can see that balloon um, over here. Um, so it's two parts. One is a regular balloon, and the other one looks like a sphere. The, um, the sphere part sits in the proximal stent, and it, uh, and it flares it open. Now, this doesn't serve, it, serve us right now, but this is important for the patient in the future to make it very easy to engage um, should this patient present again with a, another emergent cath and it you know, um, reduces the time and the difficulty in engaging uh, that stent. And so this is our, um, uh, you know, almost our final result over here. And you can see how the stent is, over, is flared open like a cone and it's easier to engage the guide or a diagnostic catheter in the future. But if you notice, even though we had a good result in the native vessel, there is some reverse flow in the venous, venous graft. And, you know, this can create a scenario where it's, uh, um, you know, it increases this competitive flow, increases the risk of um, that stent that we, or the, 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 the artery that we just opened and the stent we placed to fail in the future. And so, um, you know, looking at the literature, there's um, um, small numbers of studies that looked at patients and it showed that very high risk of target lesion failure if um, there is competitive flow from the venous graft and therefore sacrificing that venous graft um, may, is a reasonable idea to save the um, uh, target lesion that we just worked on and opened up. Um, and um, you know that reduces that risk down um, from 9% to um, a single one, two percent um, the first couple of years. And so we ended up um, um, uh, sacrificing that vein graft and this was our final result um, for that procedure. Thank you. That's great. I think <clears throat> Nick's going to present next. I just would comment on the one thing, you know, that to do the native uh, vessel 
is attractive, but it's not commonly done around the country just because it's not, there's not a lot of places that can do that kind of complex PCI. So we, we do, uh, we did 420 CTOs last year as a program, which makes us the busiest or second busiest, depending on which statistics you look at, uh, CTO program in the country. So, we, so we're doing, you know, these routinely, but, uh, there's some ongoing looking, ongoing trial to look at seeing whether or not the, uh, CTO of the native vessel versus the refixing the vein graft is is uh, preferable, but it's pretty obvious that if you can do the CTO PCI, that, that the native vessels are going to be a lot more durable once the vein grafts start failing. But thanks for us. Go ahead, Nick. Yep. Let me just say one quick thing about Nick. So Nick's going to be coming. He's going to be put at uh, EUH uh, after he finishes this year. He's staying on with us, which is great. Uh, he, like I said earlier, he's uniquely trained in the fact that he's doing that. He's already done chip. He's done advanced imaging, and, and now he's doing. And he's already done uh, structural. So he's going to kind of revamp the structural program out here at EUH. Uh, he's going to be kind of the go-to person for that, do a lot of the complex uh, PCI work. Very unique skill set. I mean, the fact that he's going to be able to do high, high-end complex PCI. I mean, we did well over 100 unprotected left mains last year. You know, this this is just kind of routine work that we're doing here. And so he's going to show you a case that he pretty much did everything on this case. I think he did it in, what, an hour and a half or something like that. So it's a pretty complex case, but it just shows kind of the, the uh, cumulative uh, uh, skills that he's uh, developed over the last two years. Well, thanks. thanks, Bill. <clears throat> Good morning. Yeah, I'm showing you the case of a tavern and PCI, pretty much two things that I've, I was trained in. Um, uh, I'll go straight to the case. So 87-year-old patient with no prior cardiac history. As you can see, there's only high blood pressure. Um, he's made it to 87 without seeing too many doctors. But then started developing chest pain for for about one week, um, and he didn't go to the hospital immediately. Felt this was just um, just indigestion, and then realized that his symptoms progressed to the uh, with minimal exertion. So he showed up at one of our um, Emory hospitals and got an initial evaluation. Um, as you can see on the EKG, there are some uh, uh, concerning ST changes. They found he has new onset systolic heart failure. And then the echocardiogram uh, showed this parasternal lung view of the aortic valve. That's their calcified leaflets. So he was sent over to um, uh, our main campus to uh, proceed with further management. So what we've seen here is, I'm going to show the left heart cath in a, in a second, but uh, there's a little bit of AI concern for low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, and the echo actually confirmed that with the uh, uh, low stroke volume going through the LVOT and then the CAT scan later on showed the calcium score of over 2000, which, you know, we use that nowadays as a adjunct uh, measure of uh, severity of aortic valve, uh, as opposed to we used to do a lot of DSCs, but the CT correlation studies now allowed us to just use a CAT scan valve score for risk stratification uh, of severity. So this is his um, uh, left heart cath. So what's notable here is that there's a distal left main lesion, uh, which looks like an acute coronary syndrome plaque rupture, uh, and it uh, involves the ostium of the left circumflex, which is about 99% occluded, uh, stenosed. And then there's a um, osteal LAD um, stenosis as well. So what we decided to do for him, which is... Uh, you know, it's not a common practice to do a, a complex PCI in a tavern in the same setting. Um, most centers do, um, and mostly in Europe, so they do sometimes a concomitant a valve, a tavern with a, a type A lesion, or maybe a, just a mid RCA or mid LAD, just a simple uh, PCI. But in this case, this would have been a, a complex coronary intervention and a relatively straightforward tavern, which um, I'm going to go through here in a second. So we set him up for a procedure to be done um, in the same setting, and we started with a valve. And as you notice, so we tend to choose balloon expandable valves in this setting uh, just for the ease of uh, coronary access. Um, Self-expanding valves, a nitinol cage that covers the STJ, and sometimes can be a challenge to engage the guides through the cells. Um, so there's a, this is a deployment under rapid pacing. He received a 26 centimeter uh, to millimeter valve, and this is a final result. You see no uh, no PVL, and the gradient was uh, six. 
So we measure his EDP, it's uh, 20, so moderately elevated. So we decided to uh, place an impella. Uh, I think in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, that's probably a, a safe thing to do because you know patients don't usually tolerate acute drop in the EF and then working on their coronaries despite the valve being fixed already. So we use the, um, the sheath that we already use for TAVR. So we already have big um, large bore access. So we placed an impella through that sheath um, and they uh, engage the left main with a guide here. So as far as, far as fixing this, like Bill mentioned it took us like hour and a half. Um, yeah, I think it's very important in these cases to be um, fast at your, uh, in your procedural time. Um, you know, you can't really spend a long time despite the fact that you have mechanical support. So we use the uh, cool out bifurcation stenting here. And the only thing I'll mention is just, it's a two stent strategy that um, you know, at the very end, you perform a kiss balloon inflation to uh, reestablish the carina, and you know we have we've got a pretty good final result here. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, when do we do that, and um, does it need to happen? I think in our patient is pretty clear he came in with an end stemi. Uh, uh, this was probably his driving. Uh, culprit for the for the admission, and we kind of you know fixed his valve and fixed uh, um, his corners concomitantly. Uh, but you know, as you know, we we, uh, we cath a lot of patients that go to um, get uh, go to get an AVR, and that's primarily because you know they put a graft on the uh, affected vessel during the cabbage. So there's a question whether should you revascularize coronaries when you do a TAVR in non-surgical patients. And there's actually, uh, there's clinical equipoise in that. So we don't really know the right answer, whether that needs to happen or not. So there's a randomized trial that's ongoing and should be uh, completed in 2026, where they look at hard outcomes in patients who receive uh, TAVR, and then uh, it'll be medical therapy uh, versus uh, revascularization of angiographically stenosed vessels that are more than 70% on angiography. And, you know, in terms of safety of doing this together, um, you know, TAVR and uh, PCI, there are a couple of small papers that um, they look at um, to, uh, they look at to answer this question. And it seems like it's safe. There's, there was no significant difference in short-term uh, safety outcomes doing it concomitantly or in the staged fashion. And in uh, one of the papers, it, it showed that there may be less um, hospital stay a decreased cost and uh, decreased AKI incidence. Okay, so um, that was our second case. I'm going to skip the th third case just for right now, and then we'll start with the fourth one. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Um, uh, Chris, Bruce, um, I'm just going to present a case on hybrid revascularization, which is uh, it's particularly at Emory, something performed more frequently than elsewhere in the country, and uh, particularly with the unique um, robotic, uh, robotic Lima to LAD that's performed here with Dr. Halkos. So um, the case that I'm going to present is a 52-year-old lady who presented uh, acutely with an end STEMI. Uh, she's a fairly regular routine battery of past medical problems uh, that we see in most of our patients, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, et cetera. Interestingly, she had been complaining of breathlessness about a year prior to her presentation, had a PET CT, which showed no perfusion defects. Uh, and she was known to have a reduced EF of, in the region of 30 to 35%. And she continued to smoke with a uh, 10 pack year history at presentation. So in, in for sake of time, I'll not show the the, angio the diagnostic angiography pictures, but in descriptive terms, she has a 70% prox LAD stenosis, two CTOs, one of the second obtuse marginal, which is supplied via collaterals from the diagonal, another CTO of the RCA, which is supplied by quite elaborate septal network from the LAD, uh, and her LVEDP was only seven, so she was pretty stable. So she underwent uh, Lima to the LAD um, with Dr. Halkos and the uh, next day came to the cath lab for her first PCI uh, of the CTO to the circumflex. 
there are a couple of ways to do this uh, staged hybrid procedure. Um, some people actually do simultaneous if they have the, the lab set up for it, but more commonly it's staged. Uh, at Emory, it's more common to do the lima grafting first. And one of the advantages of that is when they come to the cath lab, uh, you can take a diagnostic shot of that lima uh, on day one post-op and show its patency, including uh, the anastomosis site. So in this case, the lima was widely patent with good runoff to the LAD. So then we started to work on, on the circumflex. Uh, the image on the the left on the right actually shows the the starting picture so you can see uh, if you can see my cursor where is it here so the vessel that we're interested in fills backwards from the the diagonal you see it faintly filling later on it should join up here so that's what we're going to attack uh, and on the left hand side we've already wired to the lesion with with one of our standard wires and over that a little tube called a microcatheter that some may be more familiar with than others which allows us to get to the site of the lesion exchange wires give contrast or give drugs without losing any position the microcatheters are certainly the workhorse of most of the cto work um, i don't know if anything could be done really without those um, once we get to the cap, uh, we exchange for a more specialty wire with a, what's called a higher tip load, so it's slightly stiffer. Um, and through a combination of tactile and visual feedback, uh, we can navigate through the, the proximal distal cap um, and then confirm our position within the true lumen of the vessel distally in multiple orthogonal pro projections just to make sure uh, we're not flying in space. Uh, you can see that was successfully done in this case um, and once we were confirmed to be in the true lumen we just uh, continued to balloon and stent in a more traditional fashion uh, the stents uh, run from here to here and now we've got nice undergrid flow down that large uh, obtuse marginal branch so it's a successful outcome the patient was able to discharge uh, after lima and first cto and then one month later came back for a stage pci of the right um this is uh, one of the more fun things to do in, in cto work so uh, i'm going to flick back just for one second so you can appreciate the the septal network coming off the lad and supplying the the distal right with pda and plv branches down here uh, so when we when she came back, we didn't have to take many more diagnostic shots, which is why we start off with uh, the microcatheter, as I described before, uh, which is now sitting in the septal, um, and the position is confirmed with a, a small volume contrast injection. It shows us the direction we need to go with our wire. On the right, this is uh, another specialty wire, which is much softer than those that I described previously, uh, and the operator is able to wire at will. Uh, really between any septal branches until the, they pick one that uh, is favorable for traversal into the distal right. There are a few things, not to get too technical, but just before the wire passes, there's a little kink in the wire that uh, any C2 operator would be very happy to see confirming that they're in a branch that they, they want to take. So that was performed. Again, the microcatheter was advanced and a contrast injection to show that we're in the distal right. Uh, another wire exchange for uh, a stiffer wire to guide up to the proximal vessel. And I'll play this last one again, just let it run a little longer. Uh, again, you can see that the, there's a lot of movement and it's mostly visual and tactile feedback, but the wire is advanced right to the proximal cap and then into the aorta uh, from where it can be snared which is what we're doing in the next. As Faraz said earlier on, we like to create uh, loops that we can uh, convert retrograde procedures into more traditional anti-grid uh, procedures and perform ballooning and stenting from there. Uh, I'm not sure if you can appreciate it in the smaller images, but it's just a series of stents. Um, and this is our final result on the right, which was uh, really exceptional. So she's now fully revascularized in a hybrid sense. Um, and just to briefly talk about that as a concept, um, we get complete revascularization with combination of graft and PCI and really taking the best of both worlds. Uh, there's nothing that we can do, and I think it would be very uh, 
overconfident of any interventionist to say that we can beat a Lima to LAD graft. So the 10 year patency range uh, approached 98%. However, vein grafts certainly struggle to keep up with what the current stent platforms can can perform with, with uh, one year target lesion revascular revasc rates of three to 4%. Uh, and that's across multiple studies. Uh, and it's only getting better. Uh, vein graft failure, however, is as high as 46% across the board. Um, and if we look at it, when it's particularly applied to CTOs, uh, the vein grafts are, are really quite poorly performed and uh, only 20, a quarter are, are patent at one year, uh, which isn't going to serve any patient well in the longer term. Um, you can see from this slide taken from uh, the PRAG4 study um, that Comparing arterial grafts with our third generation stents uh, for, gra for, for failure at five years, there's minimal difference, about one percentage point difference. But uh, when vein grafts are involved, um, it's much, much higher over a quarter again. Uh, just to, to put it into context about longer term prognosis, uh, comparing PCI cabbage and uh, hybrid procedures, in high syntax score patients, particularly uh, hybrid revascularization carries lower MACE rates out to five years, uh, significantly more than both full bypass and PCI. And there's a trend towards that with divergent curves, even in the lower uh, syntax groups. Uh, all course mortality, there's a slight favor for hybrid revasc, um, but the confidence intervals do cross the midline um, and it's certainly a promising um, revascularization strategy. So <clears throat> I'll move on. Great. Thanks, Chris. A couple quick things to just emphasize. Uh, you know, March, mid March, we're going to be moving into a new Tower R3 project that, that's being built at EUH. And so there's going to be a robotics room there. So Mike's robotic program is going to be available hopefully at all three uh, of the surgical hospitals in the system at that point in time, which is really a powerful. Uh, option for us, unique here uh, at Emory. I think the, the other part that I would emphasize is when you're looking at these stenting procedures, the, the stents, there's a long length of stents that you see at the end of these procedures, and that always uh, raises some issues for people's concerns about patency. We have good data to look at this, uh, and even when you have 80, 90 millimeters of, of stent in a CTO, the one-year uh, patency rate uh, is, is still around 95%, which is, which is outstanding. And so uh, a lot of that too, and, and I emphasize here, you know, we, when you're looking at, uh, when Chris showed that last slide of, of the third generation stents uh, having, you know, just around a 5% one year uh, target lesion uh, failure rate, <clears throat> that's largely due to improved technique more than technology. And, and you know, and I think we do a ton of uh, atherectomy and calcium modification before we treat these lesions. Over 90% of our cases are image guided, meaning that we use intravascular ultrasound. The, the national average on this is around 12 to 15%. Uh, and that's why the, the quality of the work, you know, is different uh, in, in these high volume centers that you see in these trials and the, and the long term patency rates are, are better. Uh, stent failure, uh, instant restenosis is not a fault of the, of the stent and it's not a fault of the patient. It's a fault of the operator that put the original stent in. So. I'm going to let Miriam move on next. So she's going to present another complex case. Okay, thank you. Um, so my case here is a 53-year-old male who has a past medical history of hyperlipidemia um, with an LDL of 145, type 2 diabetes um, that is well controlled. His last A1C was 5.5, a history of PAD and a 20-year pack smoking history. He did have a recent out of, um, outside hospital admission with acute diverticulitis, which was complicated by perforation requiring colostomy. He had an episode of AFib um, with RVR after surgery. He had a high sensitivity troponin leak that was in the low 100s. And um, so they got a TEE that was evident for an EF of 35 to 40 and a hypokinetic inferior septal and basal inferior wall. Um, unfortunately, this was brushed off as demand ischemia and the patient was discharged home. Um, he was seen in clinic and he did endorse exertional angina given his recent admission with the findings that were mentioned. He did undergo a cardiac nuclear study, which showed a large moderate intensity reversible perfusion defect involving uh, around 20% of the 
LV in the LED distribution, a, T, um, a TID of 1.23 signifying more global ischemia. He also had a coronary calcium score of a little over a thousand. Um, I'll let that play. You can see most of the calcification is in the LAD, some in the CERC and the RCA. He had an EF at this point, his EF recovered um, and it was normal post-stress and at rest. So for given all of the, um, this, he underwent a left heart cath. Um, and here are the images of his right coronary system. And you can see there is a severe stenosis of the proximal RCA and also the distal RCA just before the PDA PLV bifurcation. Okay, and the left coronary angiogram shows severe stenosis of the proximal LAD, and there is this moderate stenosis of the proximal circ with severe stenosis of the mid um, and a long lesion of, of the mid circumflex. So, um, CT surgery was consulted. He's a young gentleman, history of diabetes, and a high syntax score. And he underwent three vessel cabbage with a lima to LED, a vein graft to his OM, and another vein to the PDA. He did have uh, several other episodes of AFib, so the surgical team did ligate his left atrial appendage, obviously after ruling out left atrial appendage thrombus with intraoperative TE. The operative note does mention that he did have diminutive targets, um, and his post-operative course was uneventful while inpatient, and he was discharged on post-op day six on DAPT, a beta blocker, and high-intensity statin. Unfortunately, he presented three weeks later to the ED with acute crushing, substernal chest pain, T-wave inversions on his EKG, and a high-sensitivity troponin that pre peaked at 3,800. Um, so we brought him to the cath lab to reshoot his grafts and his native vessels. So as you can see, there's a, st a fifth 50% stenosis at the Lima LAD touchdown, which um, heals. And as long as the Timmy, there's Timmy 3 flow down the LAD, we don't intervene on it. And here are uh, his natives. So the LAD, again, there's this um, proximal severe stenosis of the proximal LAD with competitive flow distally, and this, there, the lesion of the mid circ. You can also see there's left to right collaterals, which signifies that the right is most likely occluded, which is the case here. So unfortunately, see there's this um, severe stenosis of a proximal RCA, and then the mid RCA here is actually occluded. And if you look carefully, there's um, layering of clot in that mid um, RCA. <clears throat> um, then we shot his graft. So his graft to the PDA, unfortunately, was completely occluded at the osteum, and then the vein graft to his OM was also, as we speak, was 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 um, full of thrombus and a layered thrombus. And if you can look carefully as well, that thrombus is actually migrating and is going into the native vessel itself. So given the appearance of this vein graft, um, we thought that this is most likely the culprit, and we moved forward to intervene to treat the CERC and OOM. And so what we did here is we wired both the AV groove CERC and the OOM. We pre-dilated it both with balloons. And then we use IVIS. Um, we image to use, and IVIS stands for intravascular ultrasound, which we usually, which we always um, use. And it helps us to understand the vessel pathology and it helps size our stents. Um, we then proceeded to deploy a stent in uh, a T fashion, which is basically placing the stent while simultaneously deploying a balloon and kissing in the main circumflex. We placed another stent from the mid circ to the distal circ and recrossed the upper branch and performed uh, what we call kissing balloon inflation, which is basically going up with two balloons side by side and inflating them at the same time to optimize both stents. We then placed another stent in the proximal circ. Um, 
And as always, we use IVIS again to um, image after deploying the stent to make sure that all of our stents are well expanded, well, well opposed um, to the lumen and to rule out any um, edge dissection. And here is the final result. As you can see, um, you have excellent um, stent expansion. And then for the RCA, we actually staged the RCA. Um, we were able to wire it anti-gradely. We pre-dilated with balloons and, uh, as, um, and as always used IVIS to guide us in, opt in choosing the optimal size of the stent. Um, we deployed three stents here from the bifurcation of the PDA all the way to the osseum of the RCA and used IVIS again to make sure that we had optimal um, results. And so here are our final results of the RCA. And so we were able to regain TIMI3 flow throughout the RCA, including the PDA PLV um, branches. Um, so if we look at the natural history of vein grafts, the vein grafts do undergo intimal hyperplasia uh, as an adaptive mechanism to high arterial pressure. This process is called arterial arterialization which starts to develop as soon as one month after surgery. So, but the cause of early graft failure before that one month mark is usually due to technical failure or conduit to vessel mismatch. On the other hand, late graft failure is usually due to atherosclerosis. And what's unique about SVG atherosclerosis is that it progresses as a much faster rate compared to native coronary artery atherosclerosis. And the atherosclerosis of vein graft is usually concentric and diffuse. Unlike native vessel atherosclerosis, the plaque of a vein graft has much less defined cap, which renders them much more prone to rupture. Um, the long-term patency of the vein graft is unfortunately abysmally low. In a prospective study of a little over 1,200 um, patients conducted in the VA system across 13 different sites. Um, any patient undergoing cabbage was deemed eligible for the trial only if they determined um, that they will utilize at least one graft. They found that the 10-year patency of vein graft is 61% compared to 85% for IMA graft. Um, and the patency of a vein graft to the LAD was significantly higher compared to vein graft to the RCA or to the CERC. So along with the location of the distal site, they, they found that the best predictor of graft patency of a 10-year post-bypass period was the diameter of the recipient vessel. So the vein graft patency is 88% if the target vessel is more than 2 millimeters in diameter versus 55 if the vessel is less than 2 millimeters. And for IMAs, um, the 10-year patency is 100% if the um, vessel is more than two millimeters versus 82 percent if the vessel is less than two millimeters. Um, and PCI is almost always the preferred method of revascularization in patients with history of cabbage compared to redo um, with a history of cabbage. Um, and this is a retrospective study using the national inpatient sample and they included patients with a history of cabbage hospitalized for revascularization. Um, by PCI or by cabbage from 2004 to 2015. And the study included more than half a million patients. Uh, regression analysis was performed and they actually found that, um, that the crude rate of MACE, all-cause mortality and, and in-hospital complication was significantly higher in the redo cabbage group, um, which was primarily driven by higher uh, thoracic complications. And that's all I have, and I'll turn it to Dr. Nicholson to share some internal data. Yeah, we're gonna, that's a great, Mary, that's, that's great. So I think I'm gonna go back a little bit here, but uh, <clears throat> a couple of things just to emphasize here. So, you know, there's been a sort of a, in the past history, a little bit of a reflex jerk reaction to to recommend uh, bypass surgery whenever we get into complex coronary disease. I think the Lima, as, as I think we all recognize, is, is a very powerful uh, graft and, and something we probably don't compete very uh, completely with uh, from an interventional standpoint, but you know, from a vein to to stent standpoint, uh, I think that discussion is largely over in most of the country. And I think that that uh, 
PCI in those situations, uh, in particular with, with CTOs. And it's one thing I'd ask when people are looking at these and, and thinking about recommendations for their patients about strategies. You know, the robotic Lima hybrid approach is very attractive. If you look at, at as uh, Miriam showed, you know, if you look at CTO uh, graphs, so if you have a patient that has a CTO of the right or a CTO of the circumflex and you send them for a vein bypass to that, if you look at syntax, a third of those patients don't get a graft put on that vessel. So you send them for, for bypass surgery to get a graft put on it, and the surgeon looks at it and says it's a diminutive target, uh, can't be treated, you know, it's less than two millimeters, and so they don't even put a vein graft on it. So, so only two-thirds of the people you send, uh, because there's a CTO of, of the circ or the right, in addition to LAD disease, get a bypass attempted. And if you look at the one-year patency rate, it's different for, for the for the LAD. If you put a vein graph on the LAD, the patency rates are over 90%. There's something different about the LAD with the distribution, the runoff that it has. It keeps graphs open better. But if you look at the one-year patency rate for a CTO of the circumflex or the right that got a vein, it's about 25%, as Chris showed uh, in an earlier slide. So if you do the math in your head, you know, a third of the patients aren't getting a graft. And then of the two thirds that do get a graft, only a quarter of them are open. So you're making this decision to send somebody to full open heart bypass surgery based on the presence of an LAD and a CTO. Uh, and about 15% of those patients are gonna have an open graft to that target vessel that's the CTO at one year, which is pretty pretty pathetic. And so, you know, you, we, we have the same data that looks at our situations in that in one and two year patency rates of, of nearly 95%. Uh, with CTO PCI. So I think it would be something, I, I'm not going to argue about the LAD, but I think when you st start talking about other targets uh, with modern PCI and modern techniques, uh, we have a very strong uh, option to, to offer. So Nick's going to present, I think, are you going to present the last one? Or? So uh, Dr. Dr. Barker is also... Yeah, on the sorry about that, I'm here. <clears throat> we have one, uh, one case left. It's very interesting. We try to go through it. Um, quickly here. So I'm just, uh, just scrolling back here. I think it's also worth showing. Um, we did that with collaboration of, with CT surgery as well. So go ahead, uh, Maddie. So uh, this is a VA ECMO supported PCI of a uh, last remaining conduit. This patient's a 69 year old man who has no known cardiovascular disease. He has a past medical history of poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension. He presented with uh, two weeks of progressive exertional dyspnea, chest pain and fatigue, and was found to have a troponin that was elevated when he came to the emergency department in the 700 range. His BNP was 1100. His EKG showed sinus rhythm with um, some anterior Q waves, um, but no significant ischemic looking changes. He had a cardiac PET initially um, that showed a very large area of myocardial infarction. His perfusion defect involved 63% of the LV, <clears throat> most notably the anterior and inferior segments. And his EF was 15% at rest uh, with 29% uh, with stress. This is echo that shows severe LV dysfunction, pretty global. Um, and then he also has an LV thrombus that was found on a second echo a few days later. So he underwent a left heart cath that showed um, severe trifurcation left main disease. So there's you know 99% circumflex occlusion at the ostium. The ramus is a large vessel um, and it also has about 95% occlusion and the LED is chronically occluded and there's some collateral filling retrograde <clears throat> to form a large wraparound apical LED that you can see filling late. And the RCA is non-dominant and uh, also occluded. So he was, we asked him if he wanted to talk to <laughs> surgery at least, and he refused any kind of consultation. He wanted to proceed with PCI route. And so, we had planned for a high risk VA ECMO supported PCI because of his LV thrombus. And during that time, he was anticoagulated with high standard heparin. His course was unfortunately complicated by transient neurologic deficits around post and mid day 10. He had an MRI brain. That
sorry, I think we uh, just kind of lost her here, but he had an MRI that showed um, small areas of acute infarct, but that delayed the procedure for us. So he stayed in the hospital. And then uh, what's interesting about him is while he was inpatient, he started declining hemodynamically. His, uh, his blood pressure started to drop and he uh, basically went into um, kind of a death spiral and a cardiogenic shock. And you can see his numbers here uh, with the index of 1.6, his troponin kept climbing. So we didn't think that we could um, delay his procedure any uh, any longer. So he was transferred to um, uh, to our main campus here. And in collaboration with, with uh, CT surgery, we planned for ECMO-supported PCI. So this was also a concomitant procedure. We placed them in, on ECMO um, and uh, applied two liters of support. So he wasn't on full ECMO, but he, he had some support from, from the circuit. And then we performed a, um, a complex PCI. So what's interesting about this you know, uh, as Maddie mentioned, it's a last uh, remaining conduit because if you noticed in angiogra angiograms earlier that his ramus collateralizes uh, most of his uh, left myocardial circulation and LAD in this sense is the most important vessel because it's, it feeds the inferior wall, uh, interoceptum, and most of the anterior wall. So w w when we try to um, revascularize these, uh, we, we try to first balloon the left main to make sure that we have an adequate flow. And when we tried to balloon the left main into the ramus, he lost pulsatility and essentially was dependent on, his, on, the, on the ECMO. Um, so w once we ballooned that, then though he liked it, um, quite a bit, and his blood pressure spiked uh, 20, 30 points during intraprocedurally, and that allowed us to work uh, further with some specialty wires. We were able to cross the CTO of the LID anagrade, and then with ballooning and uh, stenting back into the left main, this was our final result. As you can see, the, uh, a huge territory uh, with, with all the diags and wraparound segment of the LED. So at this point, he was um, he, very hemodynamically stable in the sense that we weaned him off uh, ECMO and decannulated him on the table. Uh, and, you know, he had a good closure. So uh, his clinical course is also interesting. So he was, he did really well uh, post-procedurally. We got him on uh, good medicines. He was on triple therapy uh, for the uh, LV thrombus and, uh, and the stents. And then once he was discharged, uh, about a week later, you know, in, in the follow-up, uh, he he noted that now he can he can do a lot of a lot of physical activity. So he was walking daily, and uh, we repeated his echocardiogram too, and that's his echo on uh, two months follow-up. And uh, as you remember, he was in cardiogenic shock um, while he was in the hospital. So this was a remarkable result here. So this is all for the cases. I uh, wanted to show you that one last slide that we had here is our own data uh, for CTO PCI, and then we'll take some questions. Just wanted to point out some of our own data here. So this is, um, we, we participate in a number of different uh, clinical trials, and, and this is a progress registry, which uh, you got your closed caption on there. Yeah, yeah. um, it's a progress registry, which we're a pretty big enroller in, but uh, this this number of procedural cases is, is up over 700 that we've enrolled in this. But I just want to show you like where we kind of measure up. Uh, CTO PCI, if, if you look at it around the country, so this is all people that are, are supposedly CTO centers that are enrolling in this uh, registry. But if you look at it across the board, like in Michigan, the success rate uh, on a CTO uh, from an attempt is about 55%, which is pretty, pretty pathetic. And, you know, and so that's, and that's despite, uh, you know, we've been proctoring around the country for the last 10 or 15 years trying to teach this. And, you know, the, the, the success rates have just not gone up. And you can see it's because of the complexity of which these cases require. When you get into more complex CTOs, you're going to have to do dissection reentry or do retrograde in about half those cases. And so if you don't have that skill set, which not a lot of places have it, uh, you can't really do these kind of complex cases. But you can see, as opposed to that kind of 55 percent in Michigan and the national number on high uh, complexity centers, about 85%. We, we're about 90% uh, here at, at Emory uh, success rates. Uh, if, if you look at those patients that we fail on, oftentimes we can bring them back uh, on a second attempt. 
most important thing with these cases is, is you know, a three hour case with a with a sick patient at the end and an open vessel is not a success. You know, a success is, is a case that's done efficiently. Uh, we hope to be done uh, in, in about two hours at, at, at max, uh, which is where we pretty much hover. And you have to have low uh, MACE complication rates. And you can see our complication rates about 0.6% as opposed to the registry average, which is around 2%. And you can see from a technical success standpoint at the bottom, you know, we, we leverage uh, these uh, more advanced techniques, I think, more frequently. Uh, it's just because we've been involved in this space since its inception back in 2009. Uh, and so about half of our cases are done uh, retrograde, which is another, it's a, it's a dangerous technique if you don't know what you're doing. But if you do know what you're doing, it's very powerful uh, and, and, a, and a very uh, strong technique to leverage. So a lot of this credit goes to Wasam, Jabber, Wasam. Uh, started this program. I've, I've been here a little over three years, I guess now. And so Wasam started this uh, registry program back in 2015-16. Uh, uh, we spent a good bit of time uh, together at that point in time. We, we've had the opportunity to train uh, complex operators here now uh, since I came here. You know, uh, Leah Raj is doing a great job running Vanderbilt's program. You know, we've kept uh, Brian Kindy on, who is fantastic out here at EUH. Uh, Pradik Sandasar has, has really just... Uh, done a tremendous job down at Midtown, uh, bringing the complex uh, PCI uh, volume uh, and, and offerings there uh, really to a high level. And then, you know, obviously really looking forward to Nick uh, coming on board here uh, next year and we'll keep training uh, two more ship fellows next year. So it's a, it's a really strong program. It's really uh, got depth. It, we, we're re recognized internationally for sure. You know, we do almost every live uh, case conference from TCT to ACC to Sky. Uh, and, you know, we do CTO Summit, which is kind of the international recognized uh, uh, highest complex uh, course uh, run up in New York. And for the fourth year now, we'll be uh, the main live case site for that. So in the years past, we've done anywhere from six to 12 cases for that. Uh, and that's really, you know, we, we were recognized, I think, very strong. And I think you combine that with what the work is being done in the structural program with facilities and Adam and a seat in the gang, you know, it's a, it's a pretty remarkable program. There's, there's nowhere else in the country that has the, the strength in both uh, structural and coronary uh, divisions uh, that we have. So it's a proud of where we're at and uh, excited for, for the things we can continue to do. Appreciate the fellows. They're just outstanding. It's a pleasure to work with. It's the highlight of me coming here is to work with them. Uh, it's a privilege. And so appreciate them presenting and uh, happy to take any questions if, if anybody has questions. I'll, I'll ask the question. Uh, thanks so much. Um, that was just amazing. And I'm glad that we're incorporating this in our routine grand rounds, you know, at least every six months to nine months to have these cases. Um, Bill and, and team, uh, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of planning that goes around uh, when you have, are presented with a case. And I, I was just curious about your process you know, patients who are uh, outpatients that are referred to you versus inpatients and how much planning and time and discussion with the team and how do you approach it? Because I, I don't know, you're probably, you know, at any point, there's probably more than one way to approach something. And, I, and I, think, uh, I mean, I appreciate the question, Pooja, and I think it's, it's great. I mean, I think you have a couple different uh, discussions that go on. One, you know, is is a surgical versus interventional strategy preferable? And then uh, obviously once you get to the interventional decision, if we're going to proceed for, further, you know, there's obviously these are very, very complex cases and a lot of different ways to to approach them. We do a lot of collaborating. So we, we have, uh, we run a conference from 6.30 to 7.30 on, on Wednesday mornings. And then we do another one uh, usually from 7 to 7.30, 8 o'clock on Thursday mornings, which is a Zoom conference where we have all the complex operators from, from the program, as well as uh, a number of folks that are previous uh, Emory affiliates, uh, like Nick Lembo and Ziad Ghazal and, and some Spencer King still gets on those. And, and so it's, it's really, really nice because you get uh, a lot of uh, good input. Uh, there's a lot of time spent on on strategies and planning. And obviously, when we go into these CTO cases, you know, there's only four ways to cross a CTO. You can either cross it with a wire antegrade, you can cross it with a wire retrograde, you can dissect around the lesion antegrade, or you can dissect around the lesion retrograde. And so for every case, uh, we have those four strategies in mind. And so we've kind of hierarchy, 
uh, place those in order. So when you show up in the in the case, uh, it's a very quick transition from strategy A to B to C to D. And and most of these more complex cases, uh, you end up on usually strategy B to C. So you, you, your first strategy does not work 50% of the time. You'll be changing. Uh, and so you, that's one of the real strengths of, of just experience with these is that you, you learn to transition quickly. You learn when you're going to have to transition. Uh, you know, I think uh, I've, I've done about 3,500 of these now. And, and, you know, that would put us probably second or third most in the, in the country, you know, that, that would just, but that experience lets you plan more appropriately and allows you to transition uh, very quickly. And so I think that's why you see those lower procedure times and higher success rates with lower MACE rates. And there's no question the longer you're in the cath lab doing the procedure, the more bad things that are going to happen. So there's always got to be a sense of, of, of uh, moving along and getting the case done. Uh, and, you know, patients uh, will stay stable on the table for only so long. And so I think uh, efficiency is, is uh, really paramount to, to translating the safety. That's great. Um, hey, Bill, it's Peter Block. May I ask you a quick question? Hey, good to hear from you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, it's always nice to see wonderful cases that end well, <clears throat> but obviously <laughs> there are some that do not. So uh, my question boils down to the myocardium and when it will and when it will not get better and when it will respond to what you do. Uh, do your scans give you enough information to do that? Or when you make those decisions, how do you sit there and say, this is going to be a good case or we should not do this case? Do you, uh, what are the differences? Uh, it's a it's a great question. It's a question we we probably don't know the answer entirely to. So we so we do anytime there's a CTO. So so people have talked about collaterals means that there's viability. Uh, that 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 I think is not true. And so so we do uh, a lot of PET and a lot of MRI uh, preliminary work uh, to show that there's viability. If there's not viability, we we do not do the cases. So like, uh, and I think you're taking on exactly as you kind of allude to. You're taking on a risk of a of a low EF patient that's got your probably highest uh, uh, risk patient that you can have in the lab for probably little or no benefit. Uh, you know, we, we look at a three month uh, post procedure to see if you've had a change uh, in ejection fraction. But I think the biggest driver for us, you know, is symptoms. So like, you know, if, if the patient's got angina or got angina equivalent symptoms, they definitely get better. So like we have multiple studies that have shown that quality of life and, and angina relief uh, is unquestionable, like, you know, high 90% improvement. If you have a, a fixed perfusion defect without viability, I don't think you belong uh, doing that case. And uh, but I think if you have viability on MR or, or PET and a low EF, and usually more than 10 or 15 percent of the myocardium uh, at risk uh, with the ischemia, we we think that there's probably uh, a benefit to fixing those patients. I, I, I'm not uh, off the deep end with with fixing all the revascularizing and everything and all the CTOs just because they're there. Uh, there's people that are. I, as you mentioned, I mean, these are not simple procedures. They do carry about a 1% uh, mortality rate when you look around uh, the country at this. So like, if you're going to be jumping into these, you, you better be seeing that you're going to have some benefit. Um, and then I think, you know, there's a lot of leveraging, uh, you know, sort of collaborative input to sort of get an idea of what cases uh, should be done and what cases shouldn't be done. But, but case selection uh, is probably one of the more important parts of, of any kind of complex work, but certainly with CTO PCI. There's a question in the chat from my Dr. Taylor. Um, very impressive presentations. Uh, is my takeaway from case one, uh, is it that when there's SVG failure, going after the native vessel is almost always the first choice, if technically possible, with or without a CTO? A hundred percent. So, so, so we, you know, I feel kind of bad for the fellows here because, you know, we, we, they probably don't know how to use filter wires, which is like a routine part of vein graft intervention is you're trying to put a filter wire down to catch any sludge that, that breaks off and prevent no reflow. We do so little vein graft intervention that I don't think most of them know how to do it or, or, or get to do it. They probably know, but they don't actually get to do it. We always do the native. So, so the native is what should be done. When a vein graft starts to degenerate or fail, it's going to fail repeatedly. And so it's like almost 50% won't make it three months after you treat it. And so so we go after the, the native. It's one of the only times we'll do an ad hoc uh, CTO. So if somebody has acute coronary syndrome and you can't establish Timmy 3 flow by just sort of temporizing the vein graft, we'll do the native CTO at that time on the table in the middle of the night, which is never desirable, but that's, that's 
kind of what uh, the level of lack of faith in the, in the vein graphs that we have after they start to fail. Do a lot of staging like you saw in that case. And so we'll, we'll temporize, come back to the complex piece here and then uh, coil the vein graph. But, but very, very, very rarely uh, do we fix a vein with the intention of that being a long-term durable result. Hey, um, uh, uh, Spencer here. Uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is a great uh, illustration of what can be done. What I'm, what I'm uh, wondering about is a role reversal. It used to be the complex cases were done by surgery, and now they're done by PCI. So I'm left wondering what the surgeons are doing. Uh, and so some case, cases presented by surgeons, Pucha, it might be interesting to have some surgical cases presented. That's my comment. <clears throat> my uh, uh, other comment is on case number four, I think it was the third one presented, the uh, hybrid. And hybrid is probably going to take on even more interest here, I'm thinking, in the next uh, short period of time. Uh, if if that uh, Lima to the LAD uh, on the case four uh, had uh, less flow than it did through the native, according to the injections. It looked like the Lima was patent, yes, but uh, maybe re reduced flow and maybe leading to a string sign ultimately. So I'm wondering where the decision should be on, say you had a, a moderate, moderate LAD lesion, why not just stint that one as well as stint the rest? And, and are we working toward the hybrid maybe more than we should be? It's a, it's a great question. And, and hybrid's got some unique challenges too, because if you're doing a hybrid for a left main and then you come back to fix, and especially if it's a proximal or shaft left main and you go back and fix that going into the circumflex to get both territories opened up, you've taken away the stenosis to the LED. And so we've seen those lemas, you know, start out good and then become a tretic. Um, a lot of times they'll, as you know, they'll come back if, if a stenosis does uh, arise. I think it depends a lot on the complexity of what you're looking at from a left main standpoint. I think we still do pretty poorly with two stent strategies in the left main. And so, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of things to make it better through the years and we have some trials that have shown that, but it, it's one of the times where I think uh, uh, Lima makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, if, I think if you have a lot of uh, heavy disease burden, particularly heavily calcified and a diabetic in the proximal LED, I think a, a Lima in those situations uh, makes a lot of sense. I think the days of complete, you know, bypass surgery uh, are hopefully uh, coming to an end. Uh, I, I don't know why, and I, I don't think the surgeons would particularly like it either. I mean, that's why we get so many of their uh, surgical turns down, turn downs is, you know, they don't have confidence in the veins either. And you don't have to do the, uh, all the wound healing that has to happen in the legs and be left with a full sternotomy. I think that, that, that a robotic lima, uh, is a powerful option. And I think, you know, if I was a young CT surgery fellow, uh, there's no way I would come out not knowing how to do it because I think that's probably uh, the only bypass that you're going to offer in another few years. And, ju and just going along with that, um, Bill, uh, so what, when you see patients de novo with three vessel disease or complex coronary disease, are they all getting hybrid now? And is there any role for or when are you still choosing for full bypass to refer your patients to full bypass? Yeah, I think yeah. It, it has to be very heavy disease burden, very complex diseases in all three vessels. And, and they need good targets for the, for the surgeons as well. So if they don't have good targets, uh, I lean strongly against it. You know, I think if you look at syntax two, you know, we, we struggle against surgery. We do like in it repeatedly, like it's been shown, but, but a lot of that's because it's comparing sometimes shoddy work. So it's, it's basically saying like, is, is kind of shoddy PCI as good as bypass surgery? And the answer is no. But I mean, if, if you, if you look like syntax one, when they did that, I mean like less than 15% of the CTOs were fixed. So these people weren't getting revascularized completely. Uh, less than 10% had IVUS done. So they weren't getting very good uh, imaging to guide their therapy. When you look at a place like us, it's going to revascularize 90% of the CTOs. And we're going to use IVUS on 95% of the cases, you know, and, and that's what Syntax 2 looked at, you know, all of a sudden the, the, the durability and the results become very comparable and, 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 and you, you reach equipoise with the, with the two treatment strategies. So, so I think like, to me, a lot of it's patient preference. A lot of it uh, is honestly a little bit of a judgment call. 
uh, as the complexity of the of the LED system plays into effect. There, there's the other part too is I mean, not to say like we can do anything, but I mean there's really nothing we can't revascularize now. So like so we, there's no lesion that's not fixable, which is why I think we work so well with the surgeons is because they you know, can make a decision based on the clinical scenario, not necessarily the anatomic scenario. And so if they think the patient's clinically not suitable for surgery or not ideal for surgery, the anatomy really doesn't matter. We, we can fix anything. I mean, but it's just a matter of are there times where, where we are, you know, inferior to surgery. And I think to me, that's complex distal left main bifurcation disease and very heavy, uh, heavy disease burden with a decent distal LED target. Uh, Bill Stan Sherman, uh, that was a great talk and great that we can do these things. I guess I hear you mention the word dissection, and is there some special techniques you have to repair, ones that you have to dissect to get your work done? And also, how about perforations? Uh, you know, are they more frequent uh, with these uh, total occlusions, and are there special repairs you have to do there? As it, Great question, Stan. So, so two two things. So, so dissection, reentry. We 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 intentionally dissect. So, so we're basically we're leveraging the fact that this, that the vessel has multiple layers, and so rather than us fighting our way through the occlusion in the center of the lumen, we can go into the wall of the vessel, travel past it on around it, and then reenter downstream. And so there's techniques. Uh, there's a device I invented that's going to be, I think, really powerful for doing that. But there's stingray techniques and other techniques that we do to get back into true lumen. So the whole key is you start in a true lumen, you leave into the false lumen, and you have to get back into the true lumen. And then you just stent as usual. And the, and the stents just basically uh, are outside of the of the lumen and held in place by the adventitian. We have two-year OCT follow-up data, like which is pretty incredible, like where, where they brought these patients back, did an angiogram at two years, did OCT, like a stent coverage when you're in a subintimal space, of about 200 patients. And whether you go subintimal and, and re-enter, or whether you stay in a true lumen, uh, the two-year patency rate is about 5% if you stayed true lumen. It's, I'm sorry, it's about 95% if you stayed true lumen the whole way, and it's about 93% if you went in and out. So not a statistically significant uh, difference showing that it's very safe and very durable to do uh, that technique, uh, which is why we can do these. Perforations do happen. Perforations don't happen in the septals. Uh, you know, you don't have tamponade. If you start going into epicardials, you start getting into a dangerous zone, and the perfora uh, perforation and tamponade rates rise to about four to eight percent depending on uh what you're looking at but per perforations are a big deal like if we if you look at open cto which we had a bunch of patients in that but it was a thousand patients uh there was about uh, 70 perforations so you're going to see uh not an infrequent uh, occurrence but uh, the ones that translate to something clinical uh were about half of those so about 35 and the ones that actually had to be tapped uh were, were about 15 so so you have a, a perforation with a tamponade rate of around 1%, 1 to 2%, somewhere in that range. Uh, it's real, you know, so, I mean, I think, you know, we're prepared for it. We have special balloons to occlude. The other nice thing is with CTO, PCI, the vessel was closed when the patient came in. So you can put balloons up for prolonged periods of time to, to treat the perforation, uh, make it stop bleeding uh, without creating ischemia because they've already obviously accommodated to the fact that the vessel's closed. And then we have covered stents that you can kind of reline the vessel and, 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 and fix the perforation. So it's something you need to be prepared for. Uh, it doesn't bother us as much anymore because we're used to dealing with it through the years. But uh, uh, it's certainly it's why people shouldn't tread into this space unless you have the proper uh, training and experience like the chip trainees coming out of here have. Hi, it's Christina Thaler. I'm one of the new ACHD docs and I also do imaging here on Tuesdays at EUH and I was just curious is there a role for CT to support uh, what you are doing from a CTO standpoint um, and is there ways that we can better support you from an imaging standpoint? Yeah it's almost like a plant question that you're there to ask thank you so we, we, we love it so like we we find it very useful uh, Nick has, has spent time during his uh, uh, advanced imaging year that he's become very fast about tracing the vessel. Uh, when So when there's contrast in the vessel, obviously on CT it's easy to see, but when there's not contrast, it can be difficult to find. He's become very good at that. He's been able to put that into multiple uh, segments of the RR cycle and create almost a dynamic uh, CT overlay. Uh, for us, it's very, very helpful because uh, you have a lot of ambig ambiguity of like where these blockages start, where the vessel runs, the course that it takes. Uh, and so we've done a good bit of work with that. I think it's something 
that in an ideal world, you'd have one on every patient. I think we've had a little bit of difficulty just uh, scheduling standpoint and backups on, on timing to, to get that done all the time. But it's a, a direction that we would be very interested in, in moving towards. And I think it's a it's an area where I think there's a lot of uh, research and, and publishing that you could do out of that uh, as time goes by. But it is very, very helpful from from our perspective. And, and uh, if you go back five, 10 years ago, we were probably not using it hardly at all, but it's become... Uh, something I think uh, is extremely useful. So thanks for offering. And I think we talk offline to figure out how we can uh, maybe make it more of a routine part of our cases. Sounds great. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks, Pooja, for letting us present. It's, uh, it's always a nice opportunity to show what we've been doing. Uh, it's always been really good working with you through the years. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Don't forget your CME, and I will see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.